Hello, I bring you greetings in the name of Christ. Uh, I'm giving you a, a visual here because I want you to see what's happening in our congregation. As you know, uh, painting of the interior of the sanctuary has been going on, and uh, perhaps I thought you'd like to see uh, kind of what's going on. So here's the bird's eye view of what's happening as you look toward the front. That's our lectern and the altar are covered and the painting is happening. And uh, what's that? Oh, that's the piano and the pulpit I've got uncovered because I was using that space. And then as we look toward, uh, from the front toward the rear, you can see that all of the pews are, are covered uh, because we didn't worship this morning. Um, we uh, had them leave those still covered. Um, our space will be ready for worship this coming Sunday should we decide to worship together. Uh, I will continue to offer daily uh, the 11 o'clock prayer time and I will uh, continue to be available for you uh, should you have any need and I certainly will keep you in my prayers in these coming days and weeks. Um, I have been seeking to reach out and um, have uh, communication with as many folks as I possibly can and to see if there is need and if there is, I will let you know uh, so that we may seek to fill that need. Um, this is a good group of people here, I want you to know, and uh, we are well blessed to call each other our church family. Uh, may you be blessed and... Uh, we will discover together when it is that we will next be together physically. But for now, uh, we have uh, a bit of physical distancing, um, but continue to reach out to one another so that our social distancing uh, still is limited to things other than physical. But please reach out to one another through electronic means, telephone, uh, email, and uh, the like. May the Lord bless you. All things are canceled for now, and we'll let you know when it is that we'll worship together again. May uh, the Lord bless you. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The prayer of the day for the fourth Sunday in Lent. Let us pray. Bend your ear to our prayers, Lord Christ, and come among us. By your gracious life and death for us, bring light into the darkness of our hearts and anoint us with your spirit. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you, and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, 
but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Aminadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? He said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn, the horn of oil, and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The Word of the Lord. And we say, thanks be to God. In a moment, I'll be sharing with you the 23rd Psalm. You may wish to have it ready. And now the second reading from the fifth chapter of Ephesians. Once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention that such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now the 23rd Psalm is the Psalm appointed for today. Please join with me if you've turned in your Bibles. You may pause the recording and uh, find that space if you would like. And we shall read together the 23rd Psalm. And so we read, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me, while it is day, for night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, 
wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. But others were saying, No, it is, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been formerly blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man said, He is a prophet. Well, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked him, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents had said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time, the leaders called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Well, Jesus heard that they had driven him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. 
Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, change is always disruptive. In this story, though, of change, there are some things we might learn. First, after the man born blind receives his sight, even some of his own friends and neighbors don't recognize him. How often, I wonder, do we define those around us in terms of their shortcomings, their challenges, or their perceived deficits? This woman is unemployed, or we might say this man is divorced, or she's a single mom. He's a high school dropout. She's a failure. He's an alcoholic. She has cancer. He's depressed. We often do the same thing to ourselves allowing our past setbacks, our disappointments, or our failures shape how it is that we see ourselves. 
We seem to have a knack for defining others, for defining ourselves all too often in terms of problems rather than possibilities. And so the friends of the man born blind have defined him in terms of his disability so that now they can't recognize him when he regains his sight. Look at how Jesus sees the man born blind, how Jesus acts toward him. Jesus sees him as a real person, not as a sinner or the son of a sinner. Jesus sees him as a man with the possibility of living out the wholeness that he, Jesus, gives. Our first takeaway from this story is this. Jesus sees you as a whole person, a person with potential and possibility. Jesus is able to look beyond past failures. Jesus acts to make us whole again, despite our infirmities, despite our brokenness. The second thing I think we might take away from this, when word of the blind man's transformation reaches the authorities, they are dissatisfied with his testimony. And the religious leaders call his parents to come. And an amazing thing happens. Everybody acts out of the blindness that fear causes them. The disciples see the man in his supposed sinfulness. The neighbors are filled with fear and do not see who he has become. The man's parents are afraid of being kicked out of the synagogue. And the religious authorities' fear keeps them blind to the blind man's potential. Everyone is filled with fear. So filled with fear, in fact, that they become blind to the miracle that is taking place. The man is made whole. Now, notice how in this story, the only two people who get it right are Jesus and the blind man. First of all, Jesus because he is Jesus. And the blind man gets it right because he recognizes that he is fully dependent upon Jesus, the miracle worker, for his healing. Other than Jesus and the man born blind, everyone has oriented themselves toward the problem. Jesus and the blind man, though, turn toward the solution, turn toward the wholeness of the man's future. So our second takeaway from this story would be this. Focus not on the disease. Rather, focus on the one who heals. Focus on the wholeness offered to us in Christ. Jesus is a healer and makes us whole. Ultimately, nothing will separate us from the wholeness that Jesus gives. No past failure, no disease or ailment can make that happen. Now, third, the man who sees Jesus, notice how easy it is to label him in this story, the man born blind. The man who sees, that is in terms of his problem, his shortcomings, is eventually kicked out of the community. They aren't just practicing social distancing here. They're... Uh, driving him out. And the effect of driving him out is to label him as one who is beyond hope. Now, most of us will try to use this time of social distancing as an opportunity to move toward healthy change so that, like the man born blind, we will emerge from this not just surviving, but emerge from this with a thriving new identity. So the third takeaway is for us to notice the people around the man born blind, how they all work to label him and define him by his past troubles and limitations. They blamed him and denied his new identity. Use this time as an opportunity to embrace the possibility of a new start for yourself and for those around you, for your friends, your family, a new start for your co-workers even. Like the man born blind who will suffer and yet will offer you an opportunity to emerge from these trying times stronger and more hopeful than before, 
because of the opportunity that Jesus gives. One of the hallmarks of John's gospel is that when Jesus arrives on the scene and into our lives, everything changes. Limitation falls by the wayside with the one who turns water into wine. There's no longer a need for sacrifice because the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is here. Divisions between Samaritans and Jews, as we heard last week, fade away in the presence of one who offers living water to us all. And the one who can heal even a man born blind, the one who offers not just life, but life in all of its abundance, even and especially in trying times like these. When Jesus comes into our life, things change. That sounds good. And then we realize that change is always disruptive. And then we wonder whether the change, even when it promises new life, is worth it. How quick we can be to give away our identity as God's beloved children. How much easier it is to live with our defined, even if deformed, sense of self, sense of others, than to risk the new identity and the gaining the abundant life Jesus offers. Well, my friends in Christ know this. Just as Jesus sought out the blind man in his brokenness, Jesus now affirms him in his healing, his new identity, his new abundant life. So also the Lord of life seeks us out, rebuking all those who would steal or limit our identity, even when we do it ourselves, and invite us into the rich and abundant life that he offers. When Jesus comes, he changes things. And changes can be hard, but changes are also life-giving. For what Jesus wants for us isn't just survival, isn't just persistence or getting by. No, what Jesus wants for us is life, full and rich and abundant. The kind of life that stems from knowing that we have infinite worth in God's eyes. And diseased though with sin we may be, we are set free. And we are and always will be God's beloved child. In the eyes of Jesus, you are a person with potential and possibility. And nothing will separate us from the wholeness that Jesus gives. Use these days, my friends, as a time to embrace the new start for yourself, for your friends, for your family, for all those that you encounter. May peace be with you in these days. Amen. I wrote this, um, I wrote this up at Holden Village when our family was there for a year. And um, in the wintertime they have all this snow, eight or nine feet of snow, and every night they have vespers. And, uh, there's nothing to do afterwards. Everyone stays around and critiques evening prayer. Uh, it's a <laughs> congregation that sticks around. So this is a setting I wrote and they critiqued it. I did about three or four settings and this one got the least criticism. <laughs>
to God who is gracious and merciful. We pray for the church, the world, and all who are in any need. O God of mercy and sight, open our eyes, open the hearts of your church to the world, to all who testify to your deeds of power. Raise up voices within our church so that those who are often silenced or overlooked due to age or gender or race or economic status may be heard and seen. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. O God of insight, empower us to care for the land, for all living things that dwell in it and beneath it, Provide soil for crops to grow. Bring rain where there is drought. Protect hills and shorelines from damage caused by storms or erosion. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. O God of mercy and sight, bring peace to all people and to all nations. Bring peace to our hearts amid troubled times. Anoint leaders who seek your guidance. Bring them to ways of goodness, righteousness, and truth, that together we may outlast the evils of the world. Frustrate the efforts of those who would seek to cause violence or terror. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. O oh God of new sight, you care for our needs even before we ask. Come quickly to all who seek prayer on this day. We especially are mindful of those we name before you now. Bless our families. 
bring healing through the work of doctors, nurses, physical therapists, and all who tend to human care. For those who are especially caring for those victims of coronavirus or suspected COVID-19. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. O God of sight and of vision, help us now in this place, help our congregation to lift up the unique gifts of this community and each person to see them no matter their physical ability, no matter their past, no matter their disability. Use them, use us, use each of us. Help us to become and be creative and loving for the sake of the world. And now, Lord God, we pray, hear us, O God, your mercy is great. And now we lift before you, O God, those who have gone before us. O God of sight and healing, we pray now bring your mercy to those who face death and be with all those as we commend them to your care. Raise up healers and people who will renew and bring new life. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. O God of sight and healing, we pray you would bring in the midst of change the certainty of your love. Embrace us and call us your own. And we pray and ask all these things through the great healer, the one who makes the blind to see, who gives living water, and who raises Lazarus to new life from death. Bring life to us now, O Christ, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.